Today's podcast is brought to you by bringing needless podcasts to people. Who gives a fuck? I'm with Joe DeRosa. Welcome to the podcast, everybody. I'm Joe DeRosa, and this is where I talk about one subject with one guest for one hour. And today's topic is showbiz. What can I say about showbiz that the people doing it don't already know, and the people not doing it will find pretentious and too inside? Probably nothing. You know, they say there's no business like it. And, well, that's not true. There are a thousand career paths out there that are equally as treacherous, exciting, exhilarating, and all-around disgusting as show business. To quote the great actor Carol O'Connor, I have heard show business characterized as a refuge for childlike persons in flight from all things harsh and real. Well, I agree with that. Uh, but I also think that show business is a flight into all things harsh and real that will eventually make you more childlike and in need of refuge. In addition, show business constant pitfalls, welcome and unwelcome surprises, and ego-pumping experiences will regularly make one participating in it say, to quote Carol O'Connor again, Ah, jeez. That was a reference to All in the Family, a TV show that starred Carol O'Connor, and to me, a TV show that exemplifies the reason that so many of us continue to brave the treacherous terrain through Hollywood or anywhere else that potentially grants us stages, spotlights, accolades, and applause while almost guaranteeing failure, rejection, loneliness, and heartache. Here's the reason we do it. We all hope to one day make something as cool and entertaining as All in the Family, most of us. Some people just want to fuck their face up until they get to host some sort of dance competition show. That was a plastic surgery bit. Did that play? Uh, anyway, will we get to the cool place? Who knows? But we can sure get drunk a lot and bitch while trying. And with me today is a friend, a guy that I must say I admire greatly, particularly for his work on one of my favorite TV shows ever. It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. He's a hilarious stand-up and an accomplished writer. He's lent his skills to shows such as Outsourced and Robin Big, and he currently resides at Two Broke Girls. And in my heart, I'm glad to know this guy. He's fun. He's funny. And he makes me feel safe in this scary, scary city of Los Angeles. Patrick Walsh, everybody. Hey. Hi, Patty. Hi. How, How are, are you? you? Good. I'm good. That was a delightful intro. Thank you. Yeah. I, I liked it. I felt like I had a good flow. I didn't know if I was supposed to talk or not. Or no. Laugh or... No, you did the right thing. Okay. I was... You did the right thing. All right. I'm now, nervous. Patty. I mentioned in the intro, you write for Two Broke Girls. I do. Okay. Now, that's the show starring... Kat Dennings. Kat Dennings. Okay. And Beth Bears. Okay. And Garrett Morris. And Garrett Morris. Now... And others. Now, this takes place before the events of the Thor movies. <laughs> yes, we discussed this last night. She, she works at a restaurant by day. Right. And then... What does she do with Thor in the movies? Helps him? I think she's just she pretty much... Quips. She's just Kat Dennings in the movies. Yeah. I saw the first Thor, uh, and I have not yet seen The Dark World. Okay. I know you didn't appreciate The Dark World, I, which is fine. I didn't like The Dark World. Okay. But now is Natalie Portman in the sitcom? She plays the other girl? She pops in. She's not the other girl, but she pops in. Okay. She's a rich girl who might, makes fun of them. And then... Is she Thor's love interest? Kat Dennings? Natalie Portman. Natalie Portman... I thought she played Thor. Wait a second. No, I'm all no, no. turned around here. That's uh, Chris O'Donnell. Chris O'Donnell, right. Right. He's uh, 45 years old, kind of pudgy. Yeah. And he plays Thor. Yeah. yeah. And he's also on that cop TV show where he's partners with Ice-T. Law and Thorder. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? Very good. <laughs> and then uh, the show I write for is a prequel to Thor called be thor and after uh-huh but we're not at the after part yet no the after is is thor who plays garrett morris in the movie though morgan is, freeman plays garrett morris in the movie i don't remember him being in no it's samuel jackson plays garrett morris's part i see where you're confused samuel jackson plays morgan freeman who is playing garrett morris in okay the movie. it's sort of a behind the scenes meta thing that they do okay so it's the so that's great man yeah why would they call the Thor TV show Two Broke Girls? That's the only part I don't understand. <laughs> I, they look, don't, I mean, at least call it Marvel's <laughs> Two Broke Girls. Well, that's a mouthful. Something with agents in the title. Yeah, well, they already had Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Well, I know, but tie it together so we know that this is part of the same universe. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. with Michael Chiklis. Uh, wait, who? 
Michael Chiklis. Who's that? He plays Vic Mackey on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Vic Mackey? You never watched The Shield. I thought you'd keep this bit going with me. The Shield. I'm still going with it. The, the Shield. FX crime drama, The Shield. Oh, The Shield yeah. with the guy that played Thing. Yeah. Yeah, in the Fanta- in Marvel's The Fantastic Four. Yes, yes, yes. No, I've seen that We're show. We're real deep into this now. I've seen that show. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. good. I like the movies they made about his character, The Thing. Did you see The Fantastic You're... Four, which no. is where Thor is one of the members of The Fantastic no. Four? No. Did that's you see the spinoff really Thing movies? No, I didn't know they made those. They were called Swamp Thing, which was weird. I didn't understand... <laughs> Why they brought it into a swamp all of a sudden. Just the thing hanging out in the swamp <laughs> drinking beers. It wasn't even the thing. They made them all green. Yeah. I don't know. Why would well, Michael that might have sh- been the Hulk. Oh, shit. You're right. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm, wait a minute. Remember but the what, Hulk from Suburban Commando? Yeah, and they also had a TV show about the Hulk, which was just called The Hulk. With which, Lou Ferrigno. Yeah. Brings me back to the point. They should just call two broke girls Thor. I'll talk to him about it on Monday. Great. All right. Patty, welcome to the show. <laughs> We're off and running with a bit. <laughs> yeah, that was a deep bit. <laughs> I, I'm actually sweating. <laughs> I felt like that was some sort of UCB improv yeah, game. Yeah, that was good. I thought it was great. There's um, also, I think there's some Easter eggs in there as well. Like when I said Suburban Commando for Hulk, I was talking about Hulk Hogan. I don't know if anyone even picked up on that. I didn't pick up on it. I think it. I was so far ahead of you. I didn't pick up on it. Yeah, if right. I was going to go Hulk Hogan, I would have referenced No Holds Barred. But with the obvious, that's, even a little that's not obscure. really an Easter egg. No, 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 no. Suburban Command, No Holds Barred is the Hulk Hogan movie. Suburban it's Commando is Hulk Hogan and Christopher Lloyd. Yeah. <laughs> who doesn't act anymore for some reason? Uh, he does. He was in the Piranha movies. Oh, you're right. You're right. And so was uh, Dickie Dreyfus, who got eaten. He gets eaten in the first... Oh, wait a minute. I, Richard Dreyfus is in the opening of the first Piranha movie, and he gets eaten immediately. Gets eaten. Who's Nicky Dreyfus? Dicky Dreyfus is Richard Dreyfus. Oh, I call oh. him Dicky because I'm in uh, show business like we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. How do you like show business? Uh, well, I love it. Like I, I go to work every day, and I can talk about whatever I want to talk about. Somebody comes in, and they're like, hey, I have a ordeal with my penis. And then we all talk about it for an hour and laugh and everything. And it's a blast. It's incredible. And I, I think about... You know, I, I when I tempt in other jobs and stuff like that, you can't talk about anything you want to talk about. So it's such a like I, there there are bad things about it, like any business. Sure, but the fact that I get to go in and just laugh all day and make people laugh and come up with jokes and bullshit is amazing. It is it is the most amazing part of show business to yeah. me. Um, There's no rules really. Well, and people always say to me like like at shows like stand up shows, yeah. people come up after the show and they go, "Oh man." You got the life, dude. You just get to do these shows. And I was like, look, yeah, that's all really great. Yeah. And I very much appreciate all of it. But to me, the biggest perk of show business is that you can go into a workplace, right. a work environment, and literally talk about your dick. You can. And nobody's getting fired. And I do. There's no harassment. No. There's none of that. It's just like, yeah, we work in, this is, you. we are in the creative wheel and we need to be able to talk openly with one another. Yeah, and even the, you know, you, like you'll always have like a younger assistant, and the fear of that goes away immediately. Where you're like, oh, I hope this person does, like, because you say terrible things about other people in show business. Right. You say t- terribly sexist things, mean things to each other, awful things, yell at each other, and you just have to trust the person taking the notes that they're not going to go put you on blast. We were talking about that friends lawsuit the other. Yeah, day. that's an incredible story. And a, uh, share it with the audience, please. Well, the very abridged version is that the, the, the writer's assistant was a, a girl in the friend's writer's room, and they had all these, you can look it up, it was a Supreme Court case, but the friend's writers would talk very, very graphically about, you know, it was Courtney Cox, Lee Scudrow, and Anison in their prime, oh. and they would say, who you know who do you want to bang the most, yeah. and who do you think is best in bed? And who, it's like Charlie's Angels right exactly. there. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's great. Yeah, three, three great gals, still relevant to this day, I'm happy for them. And I'd still... Take a shot at any one oh, of them. As would I. <laughs> we should be I mean so that, lucky. I mean that in the sex way. <laughs> no, I, I mean I was going to try to hit one of them. I, in the yeah, face. That was clear. That yeah. Was clear. Yeah. All right. But, you know, and especially in a writer's room, and especially when you, if you're working late on a script, things just start getting crazy. And they, they were talking about, like I was telling you, they were like, I, Courtney Cox has gotten so thin, I bet it's all twigs inside of her. And so, like, really gross, graphic, sexual offense. Right. Thing. And all of this, like, so that's one, one example. This girl had written everything down in great detail. And that was all part of her lawsuit. She had transcripts of things people said in the room, said to her. And eventually it made it to the Supreme Court. A buddy of mine who wrote on Two Bro Girls wound up 
he was a friend's writer and had to go testify and all Jesus. this with his wife there and things he had yeah. said and blah, blah, blah. But eventually the judge said, uh, this is a show about people in their 20s having sex and the writers need to feel free to talk about whatever they want. And if that's sex, so be it. So we're protected, actually, to talk about all this garbage so all day. So amazing which is to awesome. me. That's yeah. so amazing. How do, but just, there are lines. I'm not grabbing somebody's ass or something. That's not allowed. You're but, not? Uh, <laughs> Dude, come on over <laughs> to the show I work. Now. Oh, kidding. Yeah? Uh, the, uh, well, you no. can't walk around in that outfit and not expect a little <laughs> something, Joe. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm yeah. talking, we're talking about the, my ass being grabbed, not it's me well, grabbing it. A beautiful ass. I walk around in short shorts a lot, <laughs> yeah. and they're patent leather. So they it sends do. out a certain message. Yeah. Uh, what? Where did the Friends girls fall on that whole thing? Were they, did they want these guys to get in trouble, or, or did they believe in the protection of, look, that let them talk about what they want? That It was always a little awkward talking with him about it, because, you know, it actually... You know, it affects your marriage because then they're like, well, what what, what really happens? And I can't believe you said this and all that. And it was just, you know, it's tense. But uh, he's way past it. But then actually when we did the sexual harassment seminar, he's sitting there as they're discussing his case. This guy, like it's a big thing even 15 years later. So I'm sure those actresses, when they read those things, were not pleased that those things were being said. But in the discussion of who do you think is the hottest and stuff, that's also probably kind of flattering, I would imagine. Yeah, I'd imagine so. Yeah. I'd be so pleased if anybody thought of me sexually to the point of being as graphic as i bet his dick is all twigs inside yeah i mean i would just be like wow they really thought this through yeah and yeah. cox was my favorite no well that's not true and was always my favorite my favorite as well aniston was was aniston to me was like the girl next door she was so she was like a sunbeam yeah, uh, I, I, but Anderson Cox has was never like done a lot, so though. sexy to me. Like Cox was, it was yeah. a Cox was way more like, like I, I want to go to a bar with her and bang shots and like, blah, yeah, you know, sure. like she seemed like a party, you know. Yeah, and Kudrow was just like a very lovely woman. She's funny, and like I don't know if you've seen the comeback, which my boss actually did, but it's a yeah genius show it's about show. show business actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, that raised my opinion of her because Phoebe for me was always a little one note. As well as LeBlanc. Any dumb character is always going to be a little one note. Yeah. I always picked Cox as well. You're right. But now you see Aniston and like, we're the Millers. It's like, oh, we didn't have that Aniston back then. It's like, what's going on? Where did this come from? We didn't get that Aniston till, till uh, Horrible Bosses. That's true. We, and it's odd that someone, you know, would, would start taking off the clothes that late in the game. Well, I know. She's kept it together, obviously. She, she taken off the clothes. I mean, she didn't, she's gotten that as. Uh, revealing. I don't know. She, you don't sound like you see her naked, but yeah, she's been as revealing in good movies girl? prior to that. I think I, I think you actually see her in the Good Girl boobs and Good Girl. Yeah. Um, but she in 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 the breakup. There's that scene where she walks down the hallway naked, and yep. you see as much as you can yeah, see exactly. without. That's it, a great movie, by the way. The breakup. I, I love think. it. It's one of my favorite movies. Yeah. Um, and you know, uh, uh, so so she, you've seen it, but I like that. It's it's not what you see. It's the mouth. It's the shit she's saying. Yeah, I didn't mean that in a literal <laughs> sense. It Maybe it's I'm the mouth. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she got a pretty mouth. Yeah, um, but mouth it's, with an F. Yeah, Make exactly. Extra creepy. Of course. Yeah. yeah, if you say pretty mouth. in front of it, you got to end it with the F. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, well, I mean, look, Friends is another great example of one of those shows, uh, like All in the Family. Yeah, where you say. You disagree or agree with this? You tell me. It really is. I meant what I said. You get into this thing, and it's mortifying, and it's dehumanizing, and defaming, and you mean show business? Yeah, show yeah, business. Sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you for keeping me on track on my own show. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody has to. I was interviewing Kurt Braunohler on one of these, and I oh. almost forgot it was my show for a minute. He was so convincingly talking to me about something. I was oh, like yeah. getting nervous, like, what's <laughs> Kurt going to ask me? Right. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, but, you know, I, it, it, it can be, and look, I know there are other uh, career paths you could pursue that are also dehumanizing and defaming. Sure. Um, I think any office job or, or anything that, you know, where where there's a lot of money on the line and all that sort of stuff and you got to kind of put yourself out there creatively can do that to you. There's also a lot worse. You could be a Navy SEAL and face the threat of fucking death. Yeah. You know, c cop. You know, there's a lot yeah. more danger physically out there in other jobs, obviously. But my point is, is given the career that I'm in in, in this field and 
all the bullshit you have to put up with and where it makes you feel like your soul is withering away yep. slowly but surely. Every day. I just keep doing it because I say I just want to, I just want to hopefully one day do the thing that like, you know, like when I saw Star Wars as a kid and I was like, oh my God, uh -huh. you know, you know, I, I wept when I saw Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Oh God. Now, now see, you hold on, hold on. Well, let me just say what I'm going to say first, because I, ha I have an, a gut reaction when I hear those words. I know you do, but just hear me out. You probably loved it. Didn't the, you? I liked it. You loved the fucking Phantom Menace. I liked. I didn't love Phantom Menace. I liked it. All right, but here's the thing: the, I'm not going to say what you think I'm going to say. That's why I'm saying. Okay. Let me say, I got teary at the beginning of the movie when you see the silhouette of Harrison Ford put the hat on and it plays the music. I sure. just got chills. It meant it. It was. It meant so much to me as a kid. Right. Indiana Jones, Star Wars meant so much to me. I was shaking when I went to see Phantom Menace. When it said a long time ago, and again, I like yeah. couldn't. I, I I was beside myself. I would love to one day be able to do something that that affects somebody ten percent of of what I felt in those situations. Sure, and that's why you put up with it. That's me. Is that what you feel? Is that what your pursuit is? Well, absolutely. I mean, I uh, my whole thing was always comedy from when I was a little kid. John, John Hughes in particular, right? Uh, and all those movies. But I don't get those experiences now. I don't get uh, John Hughes because he died. Right. But for me, those things ruined me. Like, like I, I always liked Indiana Jones way more than Star Wars. And when I went to that movie, I, I couldn't talk for a couple days. Really? Yeah. Really? I was just angry. Really? I don't know why they have to keep doing it. Oh, keep doing it. And you liked all three of these Star Wars. Uh, I th the first th When I first saw Phantom Menace in the theater, I was like, Oh, there was a lot of convincing my. Let's put it this way: Phantom Menace made more sense to me when the trilogy was finished. Yeah, I was able to go back and go, okay, I see how this is a Star Wars movie now. Right. It was too much to try to compute. Like, and also, it was a different angle. It was meant for kids. It was too much in 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 its when it when it was first birthed to the public. I sure I couldn't process it. Now I can look at it and go. Yeah, it's I, I get it. It's fine. Whatever. I'm not that into it, but whatever. Um, I think that trilogy gets good halfway through the second movie. I think when they end up in that arena. Actually, when Anakin says, I killed all the sand people, and he goes into the fit of rage of Seems revenge. <laughs> I'm Arab. Seen, I'm allowed to say it. I've only seen th uh, them each one time, and oh, the second you... one in particular seemed like the most boring thing I've ever watched in my life. This first half of the second one when, sucks. When, when him and... Uh, Thor and Two Broke Girls is Natalie Portman is talking about the sand and the love. Yeah, that part sucks. Sands of time or whatever. I, what are we doing here? That part sucks. But yeah. get get you, you get halfway through. He slaughters all the sand people. He starts turning to the dark side. <laughs> Let me say that. I tense up a little bit. I'm Arab. It's okay. Okay. Um, they go into an arena and fight giant monsters. There's a huge Jedi battle. All right. So from there, and then Sith I love. I think Sith is fine. I think it's as good as. You like when Darth Vader goes, no. That didn't bother me. I mean, if we're going to... That's all I remember. When, when we get to the point where we, you, you're going to nitpick a whole movie because of that one thing, it's right. like, we've all seen a million movies where a guy yells out no. We didn't <laughs> sure. ruin the movie for that reason. That's true. You know, so Sith is fine. I think Sith is better than Return of the Jedi. Easily. Oh, come on now. Easily. Yeah, because right, there's not, I'll need to watch it. There's not a 45-minute Ewok brigade in the middle of well, it. Well, I saw it when I was a kid. I liked Ewok. That's a, for, a lot of it, I wonder sometimes with, like, my, all my favorite albums come from the same, like, 10-year block. Most of my favorite movies come from that same ten year block. And I think that's when you're when you're like sixteen, seventeen and starting to really, really get into entertainment. Right. I think those just become your favorite things. The things I see now, I wonder if I had seen them when I was seventeen, if I if I would love them, or if I just go now and I'm like, eh, this is bullshit and blow it off. But maybe Sure. You know, of course. you never know. Because you're most impressionable at those young ages. Of course. And I say that all the time when somebody goes, the fucking fucking attack the clones with a I'm like you realize you were six right yeah exactly you realize you were six when you saw the other movies right um and I know guys you know uh Bill Burr actually who we just did an episode with um you know Bill's about 10 years older than me mm -hmm. and he's somebody where he's like oh I don't think Star Wars holds up it's like yeah, yeah he's a guy in his 40s yeah like he, he saw it at a completely different age it's a completely different thing for him um 
And I, I, I think, I don't know. I, there's, there's, uh, this is an interesting area of show business, though, and this is one that everybody can relate to, whether they work in it or not. There's an ownership thing that happens. And the ownership, I was just talking about this at a party with somebody. There's an ownership thing that happens with pop culture, with mm -hmm. the products of show business. And the ownership thing often goes just in the negative direction. It doesn't right. go in the positive. So with Star Wars, which is the perfect example, yeah, people go, he ruined it. He ruined my childhood. Those movies suck. That's my new character I'm working on. The the negative scat man? Uh, yeah, negative mm -hmm. scat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> scat man I gotta tell uh, you, druthers. That character's not going to... Not going to be around a long time. <laughs> it's, pre it's pretty one now. <laughs> but I wish you the best of luck with it. Take it over to UCB tonight. Maybe they'll love it. Let me show you how it works. Mm -hmm. Let me do it again. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> that was the correct answer. <laughs> yeah. um, but we, but it, it, so people go that whole negative route with it. Yeah. Why not go the positive? Which is for me, you know, you said earlier, why did they have to keep making it? Well, for me, did the Star Wars prequels hold up to the original trilogy? No. Um, did a lot of parts in them suck? Yeah, sure. But I don't care. Yeah. Because what I take away from them is I got more lightsabers. Sure. I got more opening scrolls to the Star Wars theme. Yeah. I got more backstory. It's a great way to look. I got more battles. Yeah. And I can. I don't give a fuck that he rolls around in the field with Natalie Portman. I just skip that yeah. part on the DVD, and I get to the parts that I like, and I right. get to watch Yoda fight a That's, Sith that was Lord. Cool, yeah. Yeah, so well, what helps me now with that shit, like I, I the first Hobbit, I uh, I was asleep in 10 minutes. I, I hated it so much. Didn't care, but I never liked that shit, Lord of the Rings. It's not my thing. I watched Desolation of Smaug yeah. the other night, High. Yeah. That High takes me back to like a childhood place where I'm not cynical about it. I had a great time and I thought it was awesome. That movie now, was two awesome. also had a lot more action in it. That movie was awesome. It was awesome. And I expect, I don't even know why I watched it because I expected to just fully hate it. I'm enjoying, listen to what I'm going to tell you now. I'm enjoying this trilogy more than the original Lord of the Rings trilogy. That's going to that's gonna roll some heads. I don't care about it at all, but maybe my favorite of all of them was this Smaug. It's my favorite maybe of all of them. Maybe it's because I like saying the desolation of Smaug. <laughs> I don't know. I thought the dragon was sweet. You put a little more pressure on the ooh part. <laughs> on the you. I make people. it sound like an Ikea dresser. Yeah. Uh, like, hey, can I get uh, one of the Smaugs? Yeah, I, here's why I loaded like... Loaded up in my pre. <laughs> here's why I like this trilogy better. Uh, the first one I don't think was great. I thought it was too long, oh, and God. I thought there was a lot of bullshit at it's the beginning. It's Hobbit singing about how delicious cheese is. Yeah, I know. And singing about how fun it is to wash dishes. Well, and talking about the adventures they're going to have 12 hours from them. Let the kids learn something while we're watching the movie. Oh, I don't think kids like kids. It's fun to learn. It's fun to wash dishes. You know, well, we're, we're teaching sure. a nice lesson here to the yeah. kids, sending a good message. Well, teaching them a but lie. Here's the thing. When it gets rolling, I liked it. It okay. just took a while to get rolling. Yeah. And here's why I like this trilogy more. To me, the first, th there's nothing that sums it up better than Clerks 2. When, um, I like Clerks 2. Underrated. I love Clerks 2. Yeah. When Randall, when Randall's having the argument about Star Wars trilogy versus, uh, Lord of the Rings. Yeah. And he goes, he goes, fuck the Lord of the Rings. All that, all those goddamn movies were was a bunch of people walking. Even the fucking so trees walked in those movies, <laughs> which is it's very so true. perfect. But now Star Wars, but, like my dad was in 1977 when right. it came out. That's the year he married my mom. He was like 23, 24 years old. Right. So should have been like a big deal for him. He's never seen any of them. Didn't care. So that's probably rubbed off on me. Sure. I tried to watch it with him. He falls asleep. Every time when they're walking through the desert for what feels like an eternity, the two robots yeah. at the beginning, like what the hell? It like he gets angry right. and shuts it out. Anyone where people are just walking endlessly, what just just pass time? We don't have to see them walk. Just tell us, hey, they got there. We know they got. There. If you said to me right now, which movie is better? Yeah, in the Star Wars canon, uh, the original Star Wars or Revenge of the Sith? I would say Star Wars, the original. Okay. If you said which do you want to watch? I'd say Revenge of the Sith every time. All right. Every time. All right. Why? That's interesting. It opens with a huge space battle. That's yeah. followed by an awesome lightsaber thing with General Grievous. Yeah. That's followed by Anakin killing kids and yeah. turning to the dark side. And then they fight on a lava planet. Right. It's fun to fucking watch. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, but here's my, uh, well, we don't have to go back to Lord of the Rings. I made the point. I found the first one's a little boring. I find these new ones a little more versatile.
Yeah. They're fighting ogres. They're fighting goblins. They're fighting orcs. The first one, it was a lot of orcs over and over again. All five of these, if I'm not wrong, are just them walking this ring from A to B. There doesn't seem to be anything else. And then the thing, the things they come across in the middle. But is it devotion to the books that they need to be six hours? No. Well, this this new trilogy, you know, the Hobbit's one book, and he yeah, I remember it he's adding being shit short. He's adding shit. Like, there's nothing in the book about like the coming of Sarum and all that stuff. I mean, it's maybe hinted at, yeah, a tiny bit, but there's no like actual like, oh my god, this is happening, right? There's none of that, you know. But he's, but I, I like it. I'm like, I got it. It's one last hurrah. This is the last Tolkien thing that can happen. Sure, Tolkien. I think it's Tolkien. I think it's Smog. J.R.R. Tolkien's <laughs> The Desolation of Smog. Uh, you know these. What's interesting that we're talking about them is that these movies, none of these movies ever meant much to me. Back to the Future, I always took over all of them. Indiana Jones, definitely. God, my best friend growing up used to say that. He used to say, you know, Back to the Future trilogy is better than Star Wars, and I used to get so mad at him. Temple I of Doom is my favorite of, of all the, the, these movies I we're talking about. I love Temple of Doom. I love, when people say it sucks, they're idiots. Too dark or whatever. And then when you watch on the DVD extras, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg are like, apologizing for it yeah because they were going through divorces and they felt that it was too dark like, my god what's the matter with you they're going through divorces and two of the two of the things in the movie uh there's a guy that rips your heart out of That's, your body that, they talk about that they were like they they were talk about when he when they watched it they were like this is too much and then he was like someone ripping the heart out he's like he knew right away that that was him kind of working out some shit and then the woman the sex and the city chick is the most obnoxious, abrasive, gold-digging woman. It's not? No, it's Kate Capshaw. Kate Capshaw, you're right. Who was Steven Spielberg's new wife. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I was thinking of Cattrall, who was yeah. in other shit. She's super gold-digging, super yeah. obnoxious, She's super me, like, me, me. screechy and horrible. How about awesome, there's a cult <laughs> yeah. that that sucks you in and controls your mind. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds kind of like marriage. Well, uh, all right. <laughs> But more than all those, like my what, the movies I watched over and over and over and over, Sixteen Candles, uh, -huh. uh, the first vacation movie, right? Chevy Chase, Home Alone, uh, Roger Rabbit. Never a big Home Alone fan till the a last fifteen. A little minutes. younger than you, though. I was like ten when that came out. I was twelve. Well, then what's the matter with you? I like the last fifteen minutes. I didn't give a shit about watching some kid that lived in a nicer house than I lived in, well, whose parents true. had more money than I had. Running around, having a good time in the snow. I didn't give a fuck. <laughs> he wasn't having a good time in the snow. <laughs> I didn't give His a fuck. His life was at stake. It's not funny until he starts fucking throwing bricks at Daniel Stern's head. Then I, I care. I disagree. Then I care. Uncle Buck. Also, at that age, I'd already seen Goodfellas. Okay, see, I couldn't and see I'm already movies until I was seven. Yeah, and I'm watching, like, now my favorite character from Goodfellas, like, in a wool cap being like, yeah, I'm a burglar. <laughs> and it's like... No, man, I know this guy's not threatening. His character from Goodfellas is threatening. This yeah. guy isn't threatening, you know, so I just didn't care. But I like the end. I love the end, and I love the end of the second one even more because it's violent. so crazy violent. Yeah. It makes me laugh so hard. Yeah, it's hilarious. Who's but, Daniel Stern, best scream in the business, in my opinion. Oh, with the tarantula scream yeah. is like, I mean, it's unfucking believable yeah. and, and Daniel Stern, again, another classic thing, Wonder Years. That's yeah. the kind of show you see as a kid, and you go, I want to do that. I want to make something sure. like that. It mean, Because it mean, it's clearly meant something to the writers, too. It wasn't just like, we're going to make this thing, and it's cool, which is what's cool about John Hughes. The stuff he wrote about, you could tell it was, it was him. He was yeah. in there. He was part of it. Well, Until and more you get and more, to Dutch. I, love, I fucking love Dutch. <laughs> you love Dutch? Yeah. He didn't direct Dutch. Dutch is a hilarious movie. Man. I don't dislike Dutch. Well, Plans, Trains, and Automobiles is one of my favorite comedies of all time. What is? And Plans, Trains, and Automobiles. Oh, my which God. Which is John Hughes. Unbelievable. Dutch is the exact same movie, just with a different odd pairing. Yeah, I, I, that's why I don't like it as much. I don't like yeah, it as it's much. It's not as the good. kid. I love Ed O'Neill. I don't like the kid. I'm just, I don't, you know, like, I'm just. Well, you're not supposed to like him until he I mean, comes around. I'm not interested in the kid. He changes things. his uptight, snobby ways. I know. I know. I know. Ed O'Neill brings it out of him. I know. I know. They he's, learn a little about each other. But he's a kid that does this a lot. You, you're not going to be able to see this if you're listening at home. That that flips his hair back. That flip hair thing. It just didn't know. He's supposed to be an him. asshole. I don't want to watch him All right, fine. For, for 90 minutes straight. That's what fine. happened to that kid? What's he doing? He's done a lot of stuff. He's in Can't Hardly Wait. Uh, Wait, which kid? 
He was wait. in Brotherhood. You ever see Brotherhood? Wait, who Shelton? is he in Can't Hardly Wait? Is he the main kid? The main kid. And he's in Vegas Vacation. He's, he's Chevy Chase's kid. That's the same kid? Same kid. It and is? What, what makes it more confusing is that at the time he went by Ethan Embry, and then he eventually started going by Ethan Randall, but it's the same kid. Are you sure? 100%. Because you also like Kim Cattrall was in Indiana right. Jones and the Temple well, of Doom. Let's move past that. <laughs> Couldn't it have been Cattrall? I was thinking of Mannequin. Kim Cattrall was in Mannequin. Similar films. Exactly. Pretty much identical. <laughs> yeah, I like at the end of Mannequin when he frees all the slave children. Yeah. That's my favorite well, part. Well, I thought, why are these slave children in this department store? <laughs> How, but, that's how they're getting all these clothes yeah. yeah but for me no for me uh i've you know my my dad when i was little was like what do you want to do and i from day one i was like i want to make movies and then he said which but you know, why did you but what let me just jump in why did you want to make movies what was it about only, the movies you it's the only thing i cared about so uh i would like pretend to like baseball as i still do to this day I would go with my friends to the game. Whatever. All I ever cared about was movies, and I would like obsessively read movie books. Sure. Movies I couldn't see because my dad wouldn't let me watch movies until I was 17, but he would like open up. We played this game where he'd open up the Leonard Maltin movie guide mm -hmm. and like uh, give me a title, and I would have to tell him like the whole cast of the movie. It's like nerdy shit, right. but it's all I cared about, and I would like know everything about movies that I wasn't going to watch for a decade. Uh, I was obsessive about it. Right. Mostly those comedies, and then... Uh, other things, all PG stuff. What was it about the Hughes stuff that resonated with you so much? Hughes stuff, I think, because it was Midwest, uh, mm -hmm. was a big part of it. I'm from St. Louis, and mm -hmm. they're all in Chicago. But then, also, I just thought they were incredibly funny. Yeah, they are very, they're very funny. Like uh, what what he does, and what you almost can't do now. Like I I've written one and almost going to turn in a second movie, and the stuff that he got to keep in is the first stuff that would come out now. And it's like I watched Billy Madison the other day, which right. is a very funny movie. But there's like weird, random shit in that that you just can't do in movies currently. Like Anchorman can because they trust Apatow to do whatever he wants. Right. Any other movie, like I, we wrote a movie where there was a scene with a, it was a five-page scene. The movie's about kid gets held up. They steal his ID when he's going to his 21st birthday party. He's got to get it back. A big journey through Philadelphia. So he's held up at gunpoint, and he goes up to a cop, and he's like, I, I need help. I need help getting my ID back. And this cop goes on to a five-page monologue about the horrible shit he's seen in Philadelphia and That's why great. this wallet is the absolute last priority. That's great. And it goes on and on and on. But it's interrupted by the kids, and they all have like funny, so like, funny. quips and stuff. And we were hoping maybe to get like a Will Ferrell or somebody big because it's just one big scene right. like, that somebody could kill. Just a graphic, disgusting scene of like all these bodies were found like stuffed with cum on the side of the road right. on, <laughs> that's hilarious uh and it went on and on to crazier and crazier places everyone that read the script said we love the script we sold the script which was great right first thing you have to do is cut out that five page scene it's the funniest thing in the movie you have to cut it out and more and more when we turn in any script people will say the hardest i laugh was this scene you have to cut it but what but but I'm surprised that the first note is cut it and not, you just got to clean that up a little bit. No, everything's got to be on story. And like the, the, what makes that scene. Oh, you're saying, I see what you're saying. What makes that scene okay. funny uh, is that it goes on forever. If it's a cop who tells one quick story about how bad it is, you might get a chuckle. But that for me, sitting and sitting back and watching that scene unfold and him talking about graphically these horrible things he's seeing and why helping you find your idea is not a big deal. That would get funnier and funnier and funnier, and I would be like, this is crazy, and I haven't seen this before. But more and more you go to movies, and you've seen everything. And John Hughes would take, like, he'd always bring in, like, some weird side character, or he would spend, like, ten minutes off on some little weird side plot. Like in Ferris Bueller, you got the guys who steal the car. And he'll, like, follow them around a little bit. Right. And like, But that's on story. I, I hate to say with the suits here, I'd say a five-page scene is probably a little lengthy. Maybe the note would that's be, not the can you get example? this down to a page and a half? It's really but funny. that's never the note. But that's, but well, one, I'm surprised that that's never the note because it's like, why do you want to cut a funny thing? Let's just right. make the funny thing work. Secondly, uh, the car thing serves a purpose. The that, cars, that, was, that was a bad example. I oh, just, that I, was the I, bad example. I thought, I thought of one, one movie. But, but I, John I, Hughes, it, it just, it, he, he gives a shit about everyone in the movie, and my point is that everyone in the movie... Everything they're saying is funny. So the the bar, the bar scene in um, the, the when they go to the blues bar in uh, Weird Science, love it. 
That's a good example of what you're talking about. It doesn't further the plot. No, it doesn't. It's that, just, that is a much better example. It's just a, well, that's why I'm hosting the show. Yeah. The, uh, that's, but there's five, but it's, that's a good five, six-minute scene that yeah. really gets you nowhere except let's just watch how funny it is when Anthony Michael Hall gets drunk and starts talking like a blues musician. Of course. Yeah. Or like yeah. Blues Brothers. It uh, doesn't probably need to be two hours and 20 minutes. No. But like those car chases that go on and on and on and on is what I loved about it the most when I was a kid. Yeah. Like I always love the weird detours. Like like Wet Hot American Summer is a movie of all those detours, and those movies never make money. But why not have like one weird off-kilter scene and introduce the people going to the big-budget mainstream comedy mm. to something weird and different? I never right. understood that really. Yeah, it's uh, well, it's one of the things I love so much about Scorsese movies. He is those like the scene with the, when they go and talk to the mom about the painting. Yeah, is a perfect example. Yeah, well, I are they are they making spaghetti and they talk about how to make spaghetti. I always said that. Uh, well, look, this is my theory. I don't obviously know what Martin Scorsese's fucking formula is, or not formula, but out. his process is. Yeah, let's get Ernie get him on. <laughs> uh, but like. I always said when I try to describe like the best Scorsese movies, which to me the best of the best is Goodfellas. My favorite, I love favorite Casino. Movie of all time. Yeah, I love Casino, Mean Streets, whatever. There's, it's not an A to B story no. in any sense. It's almost to me like Scorsese says, "Okay, here's the part that takes place when Henry Hill is 15 years old. Right. What's the A to B of that? And that you could uh, you could take that you could excise that part of the script or the movie yeah and you go this is an episode of a TV show this kid falls in with gangsters right here's the here's the the rising tension uh here's the at the climax he gets popped for selling cigarettes yeah he comes in and then the the wrap around the, or the excuse me the wrap up moment is the lesson he learns when De Niro goes, never rat on your friends, always keep your mouth shut. The TV episode could end there. Yeah, for sure. Then he goes, okay, this is the episode now when he's in his 20s. And the best Scorsese movies to me function like that, where, yeah. where it's just vignettes, essentially. It's yeah. like four to five or six or seven vignettes. Then like here, and I'm sure somebody said end it. They go, hey, let's talk about this coked out day a few years down the line and just follow that paranoid coked out day. Yeah. Boogie Nights follows the exact same structure as, Absolutely. as Goodfellas, like almost note for note, almost minute for minute. Yeah. They end with that one last thing and it's this crazy day, coked out day. It's almost identical, really. Yeah. But that's because those guys are considered legends, geniuses. I mean, it, Paul Thomas Anderson wasn't at the time, but you trust those guys to do it. And coming up... Yeah, look at Magnolia and... The reason, like, yeah. really creative people and like friends of mine who have sold scripts and you'll go well how could this guy who's a genius have written that how did charlie kaufman who wrote being john malkovich write for that ned and stacy uh tv show for three years because did he you, do that first yeah and then he got on to dana carvey and that kind of shit really yeah but now he's i didn't know, you know that I mean, you see the, these scripts are clearly written by like one of the all-time writing geniuses in my opinion being yeah. john malkovich adaptation and all that and but you have to prove that you can do the sh the normal stuff before they'll let you go off and do your other thing. It's yeah. kind of frustrating, but that's just the way it is. Well, it's one of the reasons that I decided to make an effort to get into like staff writing and stuff, right? Because I was out there just as a comic, yeah, writing these scripts and having these ideas and and bringing them to people and saying, "Well, what about this?" Yep. And there's just a validity that's not there. Yeah, you know they you, you have to prove yourself for a while. It's it's I always say to people, show business. It's such a linear business. Yeah, it's not. It's never the man with the cigar and the contract. No, it's really a work the, your way up thing. Yeah, and the, it's just you. The, you ge the, the generations now. I'm going to sound like an ancient guy here. They don't want to do anything. My first job was in the page program, ten dollars an hour, NBC page, uh, living in New York, and I was just destitute basically for that entire year. You make ten dollars an hour. Uh, and live in New York. It's almost impossible to do. I had no savings. But I begged for that job and did that. And people ask all the time, well, how do you break in? And I go, well, you could do the page program. Isn't that like an internship? Is it unpaid? Or, no one wants to do any of that stuff anymore. No. And the people who write me are not saying, like, what's a good starting point to get in? People are saying to me, uh, 
hey, can you? I've written ten pages of a script. Can you read it for me and give me notes? Well, it's one of the reasons that it absolutely makes me sick to my stomach that people get writing jobs off of a Twitter feed. It's that's happening all the time. Now. I th- and that's I th- terrible. I think it's absolutely despicable, and I think it's absolutely disrespectful to to anybody that's ever had to pay one day of dues in this business. Yeah, it's 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 also writing a couple tweet jokes does not mean you can write an episode it's of insane. television or a movie or anything. It's insane. Yeah, yeah. There's no, there's just no logic to like the 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 the, the uh, structure, the structural aspects of a writing staff. Yeah, sure. The, you know the different departments in a writing staff. You know the focuses. The you know whatever it is. It's like to just pluck somebody out and go, yeah, you could do this. Yeah, it's, it's such ever, a disrespect to anybody that's ever done it. Yeah, you know? nobody's ever asking me those questions. How do I? You know, the questions you should be asking don't get asked anymore. They want to know how can I very, very quickly be like the executive producer of a television show. Yeah. You just can't. You have to do many, many things. I'm very happy that, that we've quite organically yeah. gotten to this point because it's it's my favorite thing to talk about in show business um, or in pertaining to show business. Uh, and it's something that troubles me. It's this problematic thing. Uh, it's it's almost like a virus of people that want it immediately. Yeah. And I always cite uh, Swimming with uh, Sharks, the Kevin Spacey, sure. Frank Whaley movie. He's got, Frank, he's got Kevin Spacey tied to the chair. Uh-huh. You're an asshole. You're a horrible person. You've been so shitty to me. And Kevin Spacey says, you kids are all the same. You think you deserve it because you want it. Right. You got to earn it. Yeah. And as... Despicable as Kevin Spacey's character is in that movie, I am like, oh, he's 100% right. I wrote he that is. down the first time I saw the movie. I grabbed a notebook. Sure. I wrote a very similar quote from uh, Mad Men. Did you watch Mad Men? Uh, a little bit. Not. You'd, I feel like you'd love it. You should watch it. I, won't, I mean, I like it. I just yeah. don't watch a lot of... But the girl goes in and she's complaining about how she's not getting positive feedback from Don Draper on her ad campaign. She's like, you never say good job or anything. And he goes, that's what the money is for. <laughs> And that's something to remember as well. Like when people on my on my staff complain, everybody complains, but you'd be complaining, and it's like, well, we're getting paid a lot of money though. So yeah. like, he's not going to suck us off mm-hmm. uh, when we turn in a great joke. You might want that. You right. might think you deserve that. But even at this stage of the game, and I've been a writer for a while, you can't expect or even demand that kind of praise and feedback. That's what the money is for. Yeah, you. yeah. I saw an interview on YouTube um, with one of my favorite rappers. This is a guy, Cool Keith. I know Cool Keith. Uh, I'm Not a huge, huge. I don't think fan. anybody knows Cool Keith. I person. met him once. He's an idol, artistic idol of mine. Yeah. I met him once in Katz's Deli in New York. Okay. He was standing next to my table. Yeah. Like, I guess he had finished eating. He did finish eating because he kept picking his teeth with his credit card. He was clearly <laughs> trying to get some piece of pastrami out of his uh, teeth. But he was standing next to my table. He probably had toothpicks there. And uh, I, I, le- I finally leaned over and I go, excuse me, are you Cool Keith? And he was like, yeah. And we started talking. We talked for so long that I was trying to figure out how to get out of the conversation. <laughs> and I don't mean that as an insult to him. Yeah. It was just we he was very happy to just stand there and talk to me. Sure. And we talked for so long that I started to be like, I gotta get out of this because this this is gonna die. Yeah. Like before this gets dead. And um and I gave him my number. And he's like, Yeah, I'd like to come see you do comedy. I need to laugh. Oh damn. He just kept saying I need to laugh and then he never called me. Well, but anyway, Cool Keith has my phone number somewhere. Well, that's but, the interesting thing about approaching somebody who's not Brad Pitt is if it's somebody whose stars on the decline who you really respect, or you know, right. like I told you the other day about how I was, I went to an Elvis Costello concert in Central Park, and I was sitting next to David Chase, who created The Sopranos, yeah. and this was height of The Sopranos. That's yeah. my favorite show of all time. So I'm like, hey, uh, I, I'm not going to bother you or anything. I'm sure you hear this all the time living in New York, but I'm a huge fan of your show. And he was like, Are you kidding? Nobody fucking talks to me. Nobody knows who I am or what I look like. I'm happy to talk to you. Let's talk. And it was an amazing conversation. But this guy who I completely respected just looks like some schmuck. Yeah. Uh, and especially writers have a big part of that where it's like, this thing you all love, I do it. Right. Like when you see everyone giving these huge standing ovations to the cast each week, they deserve it. They're amazing. But I'm always like, hey, a little something for daddy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. All those exactly. jokes you laughed at, I wrote them. Well, Here's the thing. And then that's how writers become assholes and bitter. And yeah. I try not to do that. Yeah. I played an asshole writer on Louie. I played. You saw it. I remember him. Yeah. The guy that's like, yeah, well, you saw it. I didn't know you at the time, but now that you say that, I do remember that. Yeah. And yeah. Yes. But that was so fun to get to be the writer that's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's stupid. Yeah. You know? 
There's always one of those. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, well, here's where I brought up the Cool Keith thing. Yeah. I watched an, an interview with him recently, and uh, they said, you know, you're talking about retiring from rap and blah, 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 blah. Why? Right. And he said, because the dynamic, the he said something, I'm paraphrasing. The audience dynamic has changed. It used to be that you came to see the show and the rapper was on stage. Yeah. Now, everybody in the audience is a rapper, too. That's very true. And I was like, wow, fuck, that's Or they're it. a cinematographer filming the fucking show with their camera over their heads so that no one else can see it. Yeah, everybody. I mean, I, listen, I'm on Twitter. Yeah. I'm there. I'm part of the, the necessary evil. Sure. Uh, I rarely tweet. Yeah. I use it as a way to promote shows. I'll send out a funny thought if I think of it. Right. And I try to continue to acquire followers. Uh, and I'm and I'm verified. Thank hey, you, Twitter. Congrats. That all being said, I think, and and it's not Twitter's fault. It's our fault. But Twitter to me is like cigarettes. It has caused. It is such a fucking problem, it, like such a sleeping fucking problem in this culture, and it is created and is continuing to cultivate a monster, an absolute monster. That uh, one day everyone feels entitled. Is what you're saying? Everyone feels and everyone entitled. Thinks they're hilarious because they have followers absolutely yeah and one day we're all gonna look up and go what have we done we've ruined i it. had that moment with twitter and i'll still think of a, a joke or two a day and post them and i love getting favorites and followers and whatever else sure, yeah. especially when it's a big big person that follows me it's very exciting but i had that moment where i was like this is sick and i should stop doing it i was like uh just constantly scrolling through it and people it's it's a lie for people like when i put post a tweet at 10 a.m and 10 p.m and the same people star it, that means they're just on Twitter all day for the most part. And that's scary to me. That's all they do. Because they're... that's not cult that's not cultivating a writing career. When people say, like, hey, can you maybe slip my Twitter feed to your boss or whatever? It's like, write a full script to show that you can do it. Because a, a couple funny tweets are nothing. Or write a packet. Yeah, of course. Write a packet. Because don't that's don't post thing. every thought you have in your head and like start a cute that's what I used to do. Before Twitter, and I'm honestly super glad I came up slightly pre Twitter because then every joke I had went into a packet and I had to shape it and work on it. And then I wound up with a great packet. And that's what got me jobs. Well, and that's the thing. It's like you're not, you're not a writer because you can write the things that come into your head. Yeah. That's, that's half of it. Right. The other half of it is when somebody says to you, you got to do this right now. I need something about this. And then you have to write within somebody else's boundaries yeah, or guidelines or whatever you want to call it. And in That's the voices writing. of those characters. Exactly. And there's five, six characters a show. Each one has a different voice. And if you're doing all like little quips like, oh, this, the dress she wore at the Emmys was fucking ugly. That's not going to help you write for six characters in a show. Exactly. And that's what bothers me with the Twitter feed thing. It's like you're just writing your own thoughts. Anybody right. can do that. That's called stand-up comedy. Yeah. Uh, not anybody could do it. I have an immense revere for stand up, which is why I do it. Yeah. But like, but you know, my point is, is that's that's stand up. That's poetry. That's go up and talk your own shit to an audience and see if it works or not. But you know, for somebody to just go, well, I'm a writer because I made this funny. Yeah, but you thought of that. Yeah. You know, it, it, I always say about myself, I go, do I consider myself a script writer? No, I don't. Yeah. Do I consider myself somebody who's capable of? writing the scripts for his own ideas yes i do yeah so hopefully i can sell my own ideas right and if i did sell my own ideas i probably wouldn't want to be a staff writer for those ideas sure i'd probably want to just get that executive producer credit co-creator credit be a consultant be there help the process move along but i i, I don't think i'd want to be the guy that's sitting there writing trying to come up with story ideas every week yeah well usually though there's if guys like you that are excellent at it I'd rather be out on the road doing comedy. Sure. And usually if you want to develop your own ideas and stuff, you either have to become huge in stand-up and they'll let you do it, like a Louie, or you have to uh, work your way up, unfortunately, and you have to do those staff writer jobs to get to a point well, where that's, yeah. they'll let you create your own thing. We, the reason that my career basically started, we had little Joe jobs here and there, me and my writing partner, but uh, Robin, like Rob, the reality show Robin Big was a little, little tiny job we had, but they went in and we met with the Always Sunny guys and we loved the show. And we had like 10 minutes to wow them. And we pitched a few episode ideas and stuff. And I, they told us flat out, the reason you guys got that job 
over, because we thought we had no chance, over like really established people, is they like to hire people who have no writing experience because right. you haven't learned the shitty habits of right. television. Right. Uh, but what the weird way of doing it, kind of their weird way, the Always Sunny weird way, which makes for a very unusual, hilarious show that people love, is that now we go into these more traditional jobs, like a Two Broke Girls or whatever, and we're bringing in kind of that weird outside the right. box energy, which sometimes works great. And you can get we've gotten really weird, awesome, great jokes onto the show, and there's really funny people on the show. But it's not that vibe of Always Sunny, which is kind of a dream where you can write about whatever the hell you want. You can go off on a sure. ten minute riff about sure. anything you want to go off about. Yeah. But they hi- intentionally hire people who haven't learned bad habits, and you see those bad habits. Uh, basically sticking to a formula, which is most of what sitcoms are. Right. You see that even happen on Twitter. People will use the exact same joke structures and change two words and become huge successes on Twitter. Uh, No one's trying to come up with original shit. They're all just like rephrasing other people's jokes. And it's really the same 10, 20 jokes. They're sad, really. Yeah, it's truly, uh, to me, it all kind of reflects that, that, and and, uh, it upsets me that so much of, entertainment is this now but it's just it's such a celebration of of average exactly. you know it's, oh, absolutely yeah. it's it's an empty validation yeah. well i have this many followers on twitter what does that mean it doesn't mean anything yeah there's no concrete worth in that it doesn't provide any sort of monetary nothing there's just it's it's literally Nothing. Fifty thousand like, Twitter followers and five bucks will get you five bucks. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, it like, does nothing for you. It's like saying I'm the best at Call of Duty. Okay, right. Gr- yeah, yeah, yeah. Is is the Fred Savage movie The Wizard a real thing? <laughs> where wish. you're going to travel across the country I to some competition? Yeah. No, then you know I don't care. Yeah, you know. Um, well, and also like let's we were talking about the Fantastic Four. Uh, Fantastic Four comes out. Oh. Well, you know, let's make three of those movies because it made two hundred fifty million dollars. You ever talk to anyone who loved the Fantastic Four? They and they keep making these all the huge budget things back when we were little. Uh, you know, like a Poltergeist or like an Indiana Jones or a Star Wars. They change people's lives, and the stuff that comes out now, all these big budget movies, for the most part, except for like a Matrix here and there or something, right. are complete garbage. All of them, and instead of making. 10 amazing $20 million movies from scripts that they love. They always go for that one big $200 million movie. They spend $200 million, They make $215 million, Right. And they keep doing them. It's, it's all crap. It's all average crap. The bait and switch aspect of movie making these days is very upsetting to me. Yeah. It's the fan, like you said with Fantastic Four. Well, who cares if the first one sucked and comic book fans from here to Japan were like, this is a goddamn disgrace. Yeah. Uh, forget that. Yeah. We're going to make another movie and put the words Fantastic Four and Silver Surfer on it. Yeah. And th- they'll just buy the tickets. And they and, did. And you go into the room and you're like, f- I remember Brian Post saying in a really funny joke about um, how he hated the Star Wars movie so much. And I don't agree. But right. he hated the Star Wars movie so much. He said, I'm not even going to see the third one because I think I'm going to walk into the theater and it's just going to be George Lucas there waiting to ra- like rape me or uh-huh. something. It was yeah. something along those lines. Sure. Um, But I feel like that sort of that hustle is so present now. You know, it's it they put everything's and again, this is another Twitter online thing, buzzer words. You know, it's like, well, why doesn't your YouTube video have six million hits? Why? Because I didn't dress a banana up as the Green Lantern, (laughs) right? And then I just got clicks because the words Green Lantern were in it. Yeah. I made a thing that I actually thought was quality and I believed in it and I, I it wasn't built on some kind of sales marketing scheme. Yeah. It was just a thing I made that I thought was good. Yeah. That's all, you know, and it, it makes me so sad but that's everything now. It's and then that's another one, YouTube hits. What does it even mean? A million hits they don't it doesn't do anything for you. Nothing. Yeah. Literally nothing. Yeah. And it doesn't, it's a great thing in addition to something else. I love the fact that, you know, I'm working on the Pete Holmes show. I love that our videos, some of them gotten like 6 million hits or whatever. Right. That's awesome. But there's a TV show. Yeah, sure. There's a TV show and there's all this other really cool stuff happening. And you're using them to hopefully guide people to watch the TV. Right. That's just one little part of it. Yeah. uh, Of the bigger picture. 
Um, but people that base it all on that, you know, my YouTube channel gets all this, you know, these girls that like, you know, they strip down to bikinis and dance around with their tits flopping everywhere. Yeah. Well, my YouTube channel is 4 million hits, and now I'm sitting on a panel at a major comedy festival yeah. telling people how to run their careers. Are you shitting me? Meanwhile, some fucking 25-year-old veteran, 25-year vet legend is across town in a half full theater yeah trying to get people to come Every see time. his one man show what the fuck is going you go on see that right girl now? you're not going to fuck that girl and then the people who follow porn stars and hot girls on twitter why are you doing that it's unbelievable and you read through it and it's like had a great day had an iced tea or whatever what it's all uh like hot girls can get people to do anything we're in the middle of a boom right if now. If I follow this hot girl, then maybe she'll fall in love with me. Yeah. It's very absurd yeah. to me. And we're in the middle we're in the middle of a boom right now. Yeah. This is about to collapse. And I can't wait till it does. The chickens are already coming home to roost and it's very lovely. I, and there's nothing I enjoy more than watching the failure of others. <laughs> uh and uh it, it is happening, but this is just like the comedy boom that happened in the late eighties. Um and this happens in entertainment in waves. Something gets way, way, way out of control. Uh, everybody's a star. Everybody gets a shot. Everybody gets this. Everybody gets that. And then all of a sudden, it just boom. Yeah. It'll explode, and and then it'll just be the rebuilding phase again. Right. And I, it can't happen soon enough. I, I really hope that uh, that takes place very soon. Yeah. But with all this being said, with all we're complaining and bitching and you know fucking seething about right now. We still do this. Yeah, sure. You still do it. You still stick in it. But I feel good about the way I came up. I think you do as well. Uh, I fucked a lot of guys. Okay. <laughs> but you felt good about it at the time. I you didn't. High on whippets. But and the point is, is we're what here. Are those things called the uh, <laughs> poppers. poppers. <laughs> yeah. You had, you had a good time. I'm, real quick. Yeah. I'm happy you mentioned poppers. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> where is this part of show business now? Where is this fucking part of show business now? The blowing guys to get to the no, top? No, Sam That's Kinison, still out there. Sam Kinison walking out on Letterman. This is on YouTube. You can see it. Okay. He's blitzed out of his mind. Yeah, you missed that. He's so blitzed, he's wearing sunglasses. He, has, he takes them off. He does. I'm not saying it was good that it was blitzed. This is the part that I love. He's supposed to do a seven-minute set. He does one joke about don't videotape yourself having sex. Then he goes... Man, uh, I got I to gotta phrase this next thing real cool because <laughs> he's all fucked up. Yeah. And he goes, uh, do you ever have sex on amyl nitrate, <laughs> which is poppers? Right. They bleep the words. You see Letterman walk off the set, and he start, And then Kinison's looking at the director going, what, that's it? That was like three minutes. And they cut him short, Yeah, and that's the whole set. That, now, that excitement does not happen anymore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm not saying go on Letterman all fucked up. Sure. I'm not saying any of that. What I'm saying is that excitement. What happened to the counterculture in, in entertainment? It, it's not it's, allowed anymore. It's not allowed, and yeah. it's gone, and there's nothing left to rebel against. Right. This is like when right now the, the whole climate in entertainment, whether it's stand-up comedy or television or movie, whatever it is, it's just like... When grunge broke and then got shitty, yeah, we're we're at the we're at the, we're at the seven, candle box stage. We're at the candle box <laughs> seven Mary three stage, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, it's becoming cumbersome, frankly. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we're at that stage in the entertainment thing right now. Everybody, yeah. it, it, and I think I said this to you in a bar last night. Mm -hmm. Who the fuck am I supposed to rebel against except the guys in my own fraternity? Exactly. I'm at a point where I want to turn to people that sometimes I'm on shows with yeah. and just be like, you know what, guys? I'm going to spend my whole set bitching about that last guy. Yeah. And I don't do it uh, because there's no way you look good doing that. You just look like you're being an asshole and, right. and you're, you're battling uphill. But it's like there's just not, there's nothing left to rebel against, and that drives me nuts. There is no excitement, as you said. There is no... Yeah, the, it's, did you see this? Did you see that last night? That doesn't happen at all anymore. Yeah, yeah. And and, and the, then you're like, oh, if if it is something, it's not. Oh, I didn't see it. I'll look it up. And the best you'll get is, did you see when? Did you see when the girl from Community ran on stage at the MTV? I don't <laughs> care. Yeah, it wasn't care the less. girl from whatever her name is. Uh, Aubrey, yeah, Aubrey. Aubrey. Yeah, and, yeah. And Aubrey's very nice. Yeah. My point is, it's like, 
Did I see when the famous person did the famous thing on the famous thing to the, on the famous biggest guy? show in the world? Yeah. Yeah, d- that's not exciting to me. Yeah. That's and it's also, there's no feeling of, oh, fuck, I missed that or I have to watch that. Yeah. Because then if that was an exciting thing, uh, it, then I can go, oh, no, I didn't see it. Click, click, and I'm watching it. Yeah. It's sad. We yeah. sound like old men, but it's true. It's sad. It is very sad. You know what excites me? Did you hear when Gallagher walked off of Mark Maron's podcast? It's like, yeah, I, yeah, I, that's what I want to hear. I did listen to that, yeah. I want to hear, uh, yeah, and I did too, and I loved it. Yeah. But it's like, that's what I want to hear. I want to hear a guy that I like talking to a guy that I don't like. <laughs> they both have their their recognition and everything, but yeah. nobody hears a superstar. Yeah. And some shit happens, and it's a little some dangerous friction. or crazy, yeah. and some friction. That's what I want to fucking hear. It's not Gallagher going on, going, "Hey, come see uh, Gallagher the motion picture," and then him going, "Yeah, that sounds great. I'll yeah. check it out." Yeah, which I, is all every interview is now. I complain exactly, exactly. Yeah. I, I complain all the time about like, you know, how many comics. I always say this, and I, I don't mean this in like, "You be good to be edgy, man." You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I don't mean it like that. Um, but. Uh, I do complain all the time about uh, how I go. I always say, if you're a comic, I'm just going to put it in the stand-up comedy terms. If you're a comic, you should walk off stage once every however many times you're up there, yeah, and go, I fucked up, I fucked that up. I, yeah. I thought they were with me. I, I shit, I should have done that bit, right. And whether that leads to you going, I'm not going to do that bit anymore, I was out of line, or leads to you going, fuck them, I'm right, they're wrong, whatever it is. Yeah. It needs to start with that place of going, I took a shot and I fucking failed. And I don't know why I failed, but I got to figure that out. I don't hear comics doing that anymore. I hear guys walking off stage and the worst they say is, they're nice, they're mm-hmm. okay. Yeah. They should hate you sometimes. Sure. Oh, and not I Not because you're being hateful. Yeah. Or hateable. I see a bulk of stand-up comedians I see uh, are just so bland and inoffensive and nothing talking about the same things people have been talking about for I'm so tired however long. Of it. I'm so tired of it. You've, I don't get it. You've you've all become the things you've beheld. Yeah. To quote The Untouchables, one of my favorite movies of all time, sure. David Mamet, who to me is, is my John Hughes. Uh-huh. I went with David Mamet. Uh <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> David Mamet can be annoying as fuck. Though. Yeah. When he's on, he's amazing, but he can uh, be really obnoxious. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. I love him, though. Uh, and I love his daughter so much. Oh, mm. if you hear this. Oh, you're into her. Sweet, sweet. Joshia. Well, she's her name's Shoshana on the show. Her Zoe. Name in real life, is, right? Z- it's like it's Zoe. Zoe, like Zoeja Grass or something. Oh, it's a hardcore name. Yeah, you're into her. Oh, my God. Are you kidding me? I'm not. I think she's an amazing actor. Like, She's incredible on that. She is the best thing on girls. I like girls a lot. It's a show. I like girls. Um, and I think they're all good, but yeah. she's she's exceptionally good. Exceptionally. How do you know that's not just her? I have never seen her in real life. Because I've seen her in interviews. Okay. She's all not right. like that at all. And she's also you don't find that performance a little 20 one times note? hotter in real life than she is on that show. Okay. No, I don't. Because to me, she's doing what truly great actors do, which is she somehow found the bridge between character acting and and being and drawing from herself because mm-hmm. you know it's so often it's separated it's either they're johnny depp or they're de niro and there's right. like no in between she's somewhere in the middle of that where it's real and believable and you're like this is part of her somewhere but then also she's put this like cadence and this energy and whatever into it where it's it feels like a character yeah. and you see her in an interview you're like wow she's a very different person anyway I expect a big jojaya mammoth gush <laughs> out of you joe but all right <laughs> you should see my pants right now <laughs> uh anyway but here's the point um the point is is that uh y- you've become what you've beheld you know there was a time when uh people crucified look they crucified dane uh-huh. for several reasons dane and cook. one yeah dane yeah. cook and one of the things that they chose to crucify him over was well he's fine if you want to entertain college kids right well, if you want if you want that to be your audience, you all entertain college kids. <laughs> sure, you, you've gone beyond that. You all entertain all of you critics uh, that were so above all that. You cater to high school children now. Yeah, you're all doing 
oh, well, the clubs are stupid. They don't listen. They're not open-minded. Really? Yeah. Is there anything more closed-minded than your little fucking art house gathering? Well, well, they only respond to buzzer words in the... Really? And you guys aren't doing that? Sure. It has become as snobby, closed-minded, stupid, disrespectful, and immature as everything that it was ever supposed to rebel against in any way. Yeah. And it just very much saddens me. Because if you can't be a rebel in the goddamn entertainment business, then where can you be one, Walsh? And that's where we'll end. All right. Right? Yeah. I'm going to go punch a cop in the mouth. Go punch a cop in the mouth. All right. This business stinks. It makes us <laughs> furious. But at the end of the day, you do it. Why? Because you want to be John Hughes. Yes. Or I want to be David Mamet. There's no business like show business. No business I know. I said it at the beginning. Right. Did you? I, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the problem. And it comes full circle again. I was tweeting. What do you want to plug? Uh, I'm on Twitter at the Patrick Walsh as well as Vine. <laughs> Uh, uh, that's it. I do. I do uh, very, very occasional stand-up gigs. So I got a full-time thing going, but I do what I can. That's cool. I choose to do both. Nobody's judging. Listen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I work full days too. I still do the shows at night. Yeah, it wasn't a criticism, Joe. <laughs> Listen. Go see Patty Walsh if you ever see him on a bill. Yeah. At a live show, he's hilarious. Well, I'm doing uh, Meltdown February 13th if you're in the Los Angeles area. Go see Patty Walsh at Meltdown. He's the best, and Meltdown's a really great show. Um, and uh, and uh, follow him on Twitter and Vine, as you said, and uh, watch uh, his TV show, Marvel's Agents of Two Broke Girls. <laughs> yeah, Looking starring Natalie Thor. Portman. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Morgan Freeman. Today's podcast is brought to you by Bringing Needless Podcasts. To people who gives a fuck now I'm Joe DeRosa. welcome to the podcast everybody i'm joe DeRosa, and this is where i talk about one subject with one guest for one hour and today's topic is showbiz what can i say about showbiz that the people doing it don't already know and the people not doing it will find pretentious and too inside probably nothing you know they say there's no business like it and well that's not true. There are a thousand career paths out there that are equally as treacherous, exciting, exhilarating, and all around disgusting as show business. To quote the great actor Carol O'Connor, I have heard show business characterized as a refuge for childlike persons in flight from all things harsh and real. Well, I agree with that, uh, but I also think that show business is a flight into all things harsh and real that will eventually make you more childlike and in need of refuge. In addition, showbiz's constant pitfalls, welcome and unwelcome surprises, and ego-pumping experiences will regularly make one participating in it say, to quote Carol O'Connor again, Ah, jeez. That was a reference to All in the Family, a TV show that starred Carol O'Connor, and to me, a TV show that exemplifies the reason that so many of us continue to brave the treacherous terrain through Hollywood or anywhere else that potentially grants us stages, spotlights, accolades, and applause while almost guaranteeing failure, rejection, loneliness, and heartache. Here's the reason we do it. We all hope to one day make something as cool and entertaining as All in the Family, most of us. Some people just want to fuck their face up until they get to host some sort of dance competition show. That was a plastic surgery bit. Did that play? Uh, anyway, will we get to the cool place? Who knows? But we can sure get drunk a lot and bitch while trying. And with me today is a friend, a guy that I must say I admire greatly, particularly for his work on one of my favorite TV shows ever, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. He's a hilarious stand-up and an accomplished writer. He's lent his skills to shows such as Outsourced and Robin Big, and he currently resides at Two Broke Girls. And in my heart, I'm glad to know this guy. He's f Vic Mackey. You never watched The Shield. I thought you'd keep this bit going with me. The Shield. I'm still going with it. The, the Shield. FX crime drama. The Shield. Oh, The Shield yeah. with the guy that played Thing. Yeah, yeah. In the Fanta in Marvel's The Fantastic Four. Yes, yes, yes. No, I've seen that We're show. We're real deep into this now. I've seen that show. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. good. I like the movies they made about his character, The Thing. Did you see The Fantastic You're Four, which no. is where Thor is one of the members of The Fantastic no. Four? No. Did That's you see the spinoff really Thing movies? 
No, I didn't know they made those. They were called Swamp Thing, which was weird. I didn't swamp understand <laughs> why they brought it into a swamp all of a sudden. It just the thing hanging out in a swamp drinking beers. It wasn't even the thing. They made them all green. Yeah. I don't know why. Would well, that might have been the Hulk. Oh, shit. You're right. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm. Wait a minute. Remember but the Hulk what? from Suburban Commando? Yeah, and they also had a TV show about the Hulk, which was just called The Hulk. With which, Lou Ferrigno. Yeah. Brings me back to the point. They should just call Two Broke Girls Thor. I'll talk to him about it on Monday. Great. All right. Patty, welcome to the show. <laughs> We're off and running with a bit. <laughs> yeah, that was a deep bit. <laughs> I, I'm actually sweating. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like that was some sort of UCB improv yeah, game. Yeah, that was good. I thought it was great. There's um, also, I think there's some Easter eggs in there as well. Like when I said Suburban Commando for Hulk, I was talking about Hulk Hogan. I don't know if anyone even picked up on that. I didn't pick up on it. I think it. I was so far ahead of you. I didn't pick up on it. Yeah, if right. I was going to go Hulk Hogan, I would have referenced No Holds Barred. But would see, obvious. That's, even a little that's not really an Easter egg. No, 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 no. Suburban Command. No Holds Barred is the Hulk Hogan movie. Suburban it's Commando is Hulk Hogan and Christopher Lloyd. <laughs> who doesn't act anymore for some reason? Uh, he does. He was in the Piranha movies. Oh, you're right. You're right. And so was uh, Dickie Dreyfus, who got eaten. He gets eaten in the first... Oh, wait a minute. I, Richard Dreyfus is in the opening of the first Piranha movie, and he gets eaten immediately. Gets eaten. Who's Nicky Dreyfus? Dicky Dreyfus is Richard Dreyfus. Oh, I call oh. him Dicky because I'm in uh, show business, like we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. How do you like show business? Uh, well, I love it. Like I, I go to work every day, and I can talk about whatever I want to talk about. Somebody comes in, and they're like, hey, I have a ordeal with my penis. And then we all talk about it for an hour and laugh and everything. And it's a blast. And I, I think about, you know, I, I when I tempt in other jobs and stuff like that, you can't talk about anything you want to talk about. So it's such a like I, there there are bad things about it, like any business. Sure, but the fact that I get to go in and just fun, like, he's funny, and he makes me feel safe in this scary, scary city of Los Angeles. Patrick Walsh, everybody. Hey, hi, Patty. Hi. How, How are, are you? you? Good. I'm good. That was a delightful intro. Thank you. Yeah, I, mean, I liked it. I felt like it had a good flow. I didn't know if I was supposed to talk or not. Or no. Laugh or... No, you did the right thing. Okay. I was... You did the right thing. All right. I'm now, nervous. Patty, I mentioned in the intro, you're right for two broke girls. I do. Okay. Now that's the show starring Kat Dennings. Kat Dennings. Okay. And Beth Bears. Okay. And Garrett Morris. And Garrett Morris. Now. And others. Now, this takes place before the events of the Thor movies. <laughs> yes. We discussed this last night. She, she works at a restaurant by day. Right. And then. What does she do with Thor in the movies? Helps him? I think she's just she pretty much... Quips. She's just Cat Dennings in the movies. Yeah. I saw the first Thor, uh, and I have not yet seen The Dark World. Okay. I know you didn't appreciate The Dark World, I, which is fine. I didn't like The Dark World. Okay. But now is Natalie Portman in the sitcom? She plays the other girl? She pops in. She's not the other girl, but she pops in. Okay. She's a rich girl who might, makes fun of them. And then... Is she Thor's love interest? Cat Dennings? Natalie Portman. Natalie Portman... I thought she played Thor. Wait a second. No, I'm all no. turned around here. That's uh, Chris O'Donnell. Chris O'Donnell, right. Right. He's uh, 45 years old, kind of pudgy, Yeah, and he plays Thor. Yeah. That. yeah. And he's also on that cop TV show where he's partners with Ice-T. Law and Thorder. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? Very good. <laughs> and then uh, the show I write for is a prequel to Thor called... Be Thor and after. Uh huh. But we're not at the after part yet. No, the after is is Thor. Who plays Garrett Morris in the movie though? Morgan it's, Freeman plays Garrett Morris in the movie. I don't remember him being in. No, it's Samuel Jackson plays Garrett Morris's part. I see where you're confused. Samuel Jackson plays Morgan Freeman, who is playing Garrett Morris in okay. the movie. It's sort of a behind the scenes meta thing that they do. Okay, so it's the so that's great, man. Yeah. Why would they call the Thor TV show Two Broke Girls? That's the only part I don't understand. <laughs> I, they look, don't, I mean, at least call it Marvel's <laughs> Two Broke Girls. Well, that's a mouthful. Something with agents in the title. Yeah, well, they already had Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Well, I know, but tie it together so we know that this is part of the same universe. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. with Michael Chiklis. Uh, wait, who? Michael Chiklis. Who's that? He plays Vic Mackey on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. show about people in their 20s having sex, and the writers need to feel free to talk about whatever they want, and if that's sex, so be it. So we're protected, actually, to talk about all this garbage That's all day. So amazing which is to awesome. me. That's yeah. so amazing. How? Do, but just, there are lines. I'm not grabbing somebody's ass or something. That's not allowed. You're but, not, uh, <laughs> dude. Come on over <laughs> to the show. I work now. Oh, kidding. Yeah. Uh, the uh, well, you no. can't walk around in that outfit and not expect a little <laughs> something, Joe. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm yeah. talking, we're talking about the, my ass being grabbed, not it's to be grabbing it. Beautiful ass. I walk around in short shorts a lot, <laughs> yeah. and they're patent leather. So yes, it sends out a certain message. Yeah. Uh, what? Where did the Friends girls fall on that whole thing? Were they, did they want these guys to get in trouble, or, or did they believe in the protection of, look, that let them talk about what they want? That, it was always a little awkward talking with him about it because, you know, it actually, you know, it affects your marriage because then they're like, well, what, what, how, what really happens? And I can't believe you said this and all that. And it was just, you know, it's tense. But uh, he's way past it. But then actually when we did the sexual harassment seminar, he's sitting there as they're discussing his case. This guy, like it's a big thing even 15 years later. So I'm sure those actresses, when they read those things, were not pleased that those things were being said. But in the discussion of who do you think's the hottest and stuff, that's also probably kind of flattering, I would imagine. Yeah, I'd imagine so. Yeah. I'd be so pleased if anybody thought of me sexually to the point <laughs> of being as graphic as I bet his dick is all twigs inside. Yeah. I mean, I would just be like, wow, they really thought this through. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Cox was my favorite. No, well, that's not true. Cox Aniston, was always my favorite, my favorite as well. Aniston was... was Addison to me was like the girl next door. She was so she was like a sunbeam. Yeah, uh, I, I, but Aniston Cox has never like done a lot. So though. sexy to me, like Cox was it was yeah. a, Cox was way more like like I, I want to go to a bar with her and bang shots and like wow, yeah, you know, sure. like she seemed like a party, you know. Yeah, and Kudrow was just like a very lovely woman. She's funny, and like I don't know if you've seen the comeback, which my boss actually did, but it's a yeah genius show it's about show. show business actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, that. Raise my opinion of her because Phoebe for me was always a little one note, as well as LeBlanc. Any dumb character is always going to be a little one note. Yeah, I always picked Cox as well. You're right, but now you see Aniston and like we're the Millers. It's like oh, we didn't have that Aniston back then. It's like, what's going on? Where did this come from? We didn't get that Aniston till till a uh, horrible boss laugh all day and make people laugh and come up with jokes and bullshit is amazing. It is. It is the most amazing part of show business to yeah. me. Um, There's no rules really. Well, and people always say to me like. Like at shows, like stand up shows. Yeah. People come up after the show and they'll go, Oh man, you got the life, dude. You just get to do these shows. And it's like, Look, yeah, that's all really great. Yeah. And I very much appreciate all of it. But to me, the biggest perk of show business is that you can go into a workplace, right. a work environment, and literally talk about your dick. You can. And nobody's getting fired. And I do. There's no harassment. No. There's none of that. It's just like, yeah, we work in, this is, you. we are in the creative wheel, and we need to be able to talk openly with one another. Yeah, and even, the, you know, you, like you'll always have like a younger assistant, and the fear of that goes away immediately where you're like, oh, I hope this person does, because like, you say terrible things about other people in show business. Right. You say t terribly sexist things, mean things to each other, awful things, yell at each other. And you just have to trust the person taking the notes that they're not going to go put you on blast. We were talking about that friend's lawsuit the other yeah, day. Yeah, that's an incredible story. And a, uh, Share it with the audience, please. Well, the very abridged version is that the, the, the writer's assistant was a, a girl in the friend's writer's room. And they had all these, you can look it up, it was a Supreme Court case. But the friend's writers would talk very, very graphically about, you know, it was Courtney Cox, Lisa Goudreau, and Anison in their prime. Oh. And they would say, who you know, who do you want to bang the most? Yeah. And who do you think is best in bed? And who It's like Charlie's Angels right exactly. there. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's great. Yeah, three, three great gals still relevant to this day. I'm happy for them. And I'd still take a shot at any one oh, of them. As would I. <laughs> we should be I mean so that, lucky. I mean that in the sex way. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I was going to try to hit one of them. I, in the yeah, face. That was clear. That yeah. Was clear. Yeah. All right. But, you know, especially in a writer's room, and especially when you, if you're working late on a script, things just start getting crazy. And they, they were talking about, like I was telling you, they were like, I. Courtney Cox has gotten so thin, I bet it's all twigs inside of her. And so, like, really gross, graphic, sexual, offensive right. thing. And all of this, like, so that's one one example. This girl had written everything down in great detail, and that was all part of her lawsuit. She had transcripts of things people said in the room, said to her, and eventually it made it to the Supreme Court. A buddy of mine who wrote on Two Bro Girls wound up, he was a friend's writer and had to go testify and all Jesus. this with his wife there and things he had yeah. said and blah, blah, blah. But eventually the judge said... Uh, this is a